Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who shows us great compassion that we cannot understand, who loves us to the end, who loves us despite our sin enough to give up his Son so that we could experience his patience now and forever. Amen. When you open up your bulletin today or you see the theme on the the screen, do you kind of stop and wonder, reckless patience? You know, what is that? As I was kind of getting ready for this sermon, I, I kind of wondered the same thing. What is reckless patience? I don't know if I've ever seen it. But maybe we can understand, you know, reckless anger or reckless wrath a little bit easier. We probably have seen that more often than reckless patience. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of some lashing out that someone had given you. Or maybe you were the one sadly giving it out. You know, it's a lot easier to give reckless anger or frustration than it is to just give normal patience. We have to work at patience. We have to try to think about it and work at it. But so often we struggle at it. Today we hear an example or a story of reckless patience that seems to only come from God, and that's probably correct, because we as humans can't show this kind of reckless patience on our own. So let's dive in and see this reckless patience for ourselves. Have you ever watched a movie or maybe read a book where they begin with the like? the last scenes of the movie or or the book. And you see things that are unfolding that are supposed to be happening on the end. And I think this kind of technique is quite interesting to use. It leads you thinking about some questions. How did we get here? What happened? What was all the things that led up to this moment? Right? There's a a purpose of using that kind of tactic in telling a story. Well, I'm going to kind of use that today for us. We're going to kind of start at the end of our section. And we enter, maybe you can see on your screen, so to speak, in your minds, and you see Jesus in the temple courts. There's people from the community gathered around him and people from afar listening to him teach. And there around him are the chief priests and Pharisees as well, listening on. But Jesus had gotten done telling his story and explaining things. And then you get to this. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. You know, could you kind of picture this scene unfolding? You could picture the the chief priests and the Pharisees walking off in anger and frustration, and they're going off in a huff because of how, how angry they are at Jesus for addressing them the way he did. And they wanted to find a way to arrest him or get rid of him somehow. But they were afraid of how all the people would react and how that could backfire and all of that. You know, are are you kind of seeing this scene and wondering, how did we get here? What happened? You know, how, how did this all unfold? What did Jesus say to them? Well, then the the screen cuts, goes black, and it goes to the beginning of our text, not that long before. And you see Jesus again in the temple courts. The scene hasn't changed. The people around him didn't change. You still have the same people. The chief priests and Pharisees were all there. You know, you see all this kind of unfolding before you. And Jesus is about to tell a story or a parable, trying to draw the people in to listen to him. Listen to his words. And a good story, a good parable, you know, It makes someone think. It makes them think about their lives. It makes them wonder, how does this apply to me? How wonderful it is to tell a story. 
And maybe in your mind, you're already saying, Pastor, tell us Jesus' story already. And, and we will. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Again, if you're watching the film in your mind, you have Jesus here. It goes, the scene goes black, and then all of a sudden you see this lush field on the screen. Nothing has ever touched it. No one has ever built anything on it. And then you, you see this image in the middle of the field, and the camera zooms up on him. And you see him hard at work in that field. You know, he, he, he's trying to build a, a vineyard in it. And he's up when the sun rises, he stays up till the sun goes down, working day and night in this field that he wants to be his vineyard. He, he builds the trellises for his grapevines. He, he plants his vines in the ground. He, he takes the time to you know, protect his, his vineyard. So he finds all these field stones and all of these different things to build a, a giant wall around it. And he decides he wants extra protection, so he builds this giant watchtower to look over his field to make sure animals don't get in or, or people that could destroy his vineyard or steal his crop. And then he decides to build a, a wine press because he wants to process it himself. He doesn't want to hire it out and spend more money. He, he wants to do it himself and make sure the quality is good and, and everything is done right. You know, you're watching the scene unfold, and, and I, I don't think you would doubt that this individual cares about his vineyard and field greatly. You know, he, he, he's willing to put in his own blood, and, blood, sweat, and tears into this field to, to make it what it is. And then you could see the scene change again, and you see the, the vineyard has grown big, and everything looks wonderful. And, and you could see that, you know, his, his hard work paid off and how nice everything is. And finally, he gets to this point where he's like, I, I, I'm done. I've done my work. It's all good. You know, I, I could hire this out to other people to now take care of and make sure it keeps going. And again, that's what the, the vineyard guy does. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. You know, can you kind of picture this in our, our today's world? Maybe you know some people who own fields and things like that around here, and they rent them out to farmers to tend and grow and take care of. But when it comes time, they have to pay the people who own the land, who own the field, and pay them what they agreed upon or whatever that may be. You know, this is kind of a similar situation like that. Here are the farmers that have this field that belongs to this owner. They're tending it, they're caring for it, and eventually they have to pay them back if it be with fruit or money, so to speak. And you'd think this would play out well, the scene, but you'd be corrected. It doesn't play out very well. You know, the, the landowner sees his time to get his payment, get his fruit. And so he sends some servants. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. As you watch everything happening, you, you might wonder, you know, how could the farmers do such a thing? How, how could they treat this landowner's servants this way? This is no way to treat anybody, you know, to essentially beat one, they, they killed another, so you see the, the viciousness in them, you, you see them stoning a, a, a third, wow, you know, you're thinking maybe to yourself, how, how could this landowner send these servants out like this? Why does he keep sending one after another, especially after the second one, why does he send a third? You know, well, he's being patient with them, he, he should strike them down, take what is his, but he doesn't. And what might seem like reckless patience is in our next section. What does the landowner do? Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Well, what is going on in this landowner's mind 
that he would send even more than he had sent out the first several times. You know, what kind of you know, response would he, was he expecting? You know, was he expecting them to change? From our minds, we'd say, no, they won't. They'll keep doing the same thing. But he wanted them to change. He wanted them to continue to, you know, give back what was his. And what may seem even crazier from this landowner is what he does next. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. You're probably thinking, really? Really? You think they're going to respect your son? You know, they didn't respect any of your servants. But in his mind, you know, the, the son is the, the right-hand man. You know, if they don't listen to my son, they're not going to listen to anyone. You know, the, he is my messenger. But no surprise to us and probably to those listeners what ends up happening. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Are you kind of thinking to yourself, Yep, <laughs> saw that one coming. You know, I, I didn't see it working out well in any way. You know, you, you see, again, what might seem like recklessness. But this landowner wants to reach out to them. He wants them to turn away from their wickedness and, and sin. But they simply don't do it. You can see, again, the, the scene change. The screen goes dark. You're back in the temple courtyards. Jesus had just wrapped up the, the, this parable or story. And all the people are listening intently. And then Jesus asks a question of the people, trying to get them to think about what he just said. He says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they reply. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. You know, the, the response that has been given is what, you know, you would expect from the people. You know, if people do wrong, we expect some kind of punishment upon their head. You know, that, that landowner was extremely patient for a very, very long time Get risking people's lives in the process to reach the, those lost farmers that were stubborn in their ways. You know, the, the, the patience of the landowner will run out. And they will be punished. And the people knew it, that they would receive the, 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 their wretched end. As you think about this parable, maybe it's good to maybe identify some of these people. You know, the landowner is the father. The son is Jesus. The tenants are the chief priests and Pharisees and those who, who deny, you know, giving back to the Lord what is rightfully his or, or believing in him or serving him. You know, you think about all the servants that have gone before in the Old Testament, the, the judges and prophets and how they were beaten and mocked and, you know, killed and all of that. You think about even the, the New Testament disciples as they went out and proclaimed God's word. How were they treated? You know, they too were beaten, killed, put in prison. You know, these are things that God, our Savior Jesus, wanted those people to think about in us. And again, like any good story, you must apply it. You must be able to relate to it. And so Jesus again applies it. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. 
Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Any one of whom it falls will be crushed. Who is Jesus? He is this stone. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation that everything is built. All believers find their footing in their rock hold on Jesus himself. Their, their lives and their thoughts and emotions and service are always to that rock that they stand on. Even when the, the, the rest of the ground seems to be you know, quicksand, the ground on which Jesus is built is a solid rock. It cannot be moved. It cannot be shaken. It, it stands firm forever. This is the Jesus, the, the Son that came. Yet, this stone became a stumbling block to many. Many rejected this stone that God wanted to build his church upon. And even his own religious leaders denied and rejected this stone. And those who deny it and reject it, what will happen to them? They will be broken to pieces. They will be crushed by this stone. They will endure the, the wrath and punishment of hell for rejecting this stone. And how often God is, is patient with these religious leaders and those who reject him, giving them time, giving him people to reach out and say, turn back from your sin. Turn to your, the, the Savior of the world. Turn to, to Jesus. You know, how, how patient God is. How patient the Son of God is. Even when they rejected him. Even when they wanted to throw him in prison. Even when they wanted to kill him. He continues to reach out to them. Maybe let's make the screen black again. And, the, and the, the scene changes. But this time on the screen, you, you notice yourself. You, you see your, your life unfolding before you. And, and you, you think about this parable that, that Jesus said, you know, how, how does this apply to you? How does this impact your life? You know, maybe you think, you know, I, I'm not like those tenants. I'm not like those farmers. You know, I haven't rejected, you know, people who have come to me and pointed out my sin. You know, I, I didn't leave my, my pastor bloodied on the side of the road when he told me, you know, it, it's good to go to church. You know, it's good to be in God's word. You know, I, I, I didn't punch him in the face in that moment. You know, or, or maybe there was religious leaders in the church that have been trying to reach out and you say, no, I, I, I didn't, you know, I listened to them. You know, I, I listened to their words. So often we view ourselves more highly than we should. You know, no matter if we physically attack God's messengers or verbally abuse them, you know, the thoughts of, of you know, who are you to say anything to me is just as wrong. Or maybe you remember times when you have lashed out at, at you know, your, your, your pastor or, or you know, a, a religious leader that was caring for your spiritual well-being the best they could. Or maybe you experience this on the receiving end. You, you go out and, and tell your family and friends, you know, about Jesus. You say, you know, the path they're going on is not good. Jesus wants you. He is, you are the fruit that he desires. Give to him what is his. And maybe they say, you know, be gone. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. They slam the door in your face and all of that. So often our sinful nature resents and hates <laughs> When God is patient with us in a certain way, you know, Lord, I, I got time. I, I don't want to deal with this. I, I want to keep living the life I, I want to live. 
Or, or maybe we end up abusing God's patience and say, you know, God, God will come around again. I know he will. You know, he, he has to be patient with me. Aren't we abusing God's patience? <laughs> Are we abusing God's love when we don't listen to the shepherds God has placed in our lives to reach out to us? The church leaders who, who care for the souls and hearts of, of God's people? The, the fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who, who love the, the, the spiritual well-being of each other? You know, how important that is to understand that for our lives. In our service to him, maybe you are one of those servants that, that needs to go out. But you say, I, I really don't want to see how this plays out. I don't really want to see how I, I might be mistreated. But doesn't God care for that soul? You know, he, he has you, he has that fruit as you go out and serve him. You, you know what the end result is, even if we are ridiculed or mocked or, or even put in prison or killed. As Christians, we have eternal life. We have salvation with him. What a blessing it is to have this comfort and reassurance. Lord, forgive us for the times we've been like the tenants. Lord, forgive us like the times we've been like the, the, the farmers there. When we haven't listened to your servants. When we haven't listened to you. What grace it is and mercy that God shows this reckless patience to us. Yes, he, he should wipe us out, eliminate us there and then, but he does not. He continues again to reach out because of the one who, who came into this world, his son, who was ridiculed and mocked, who, who was pierced to the cross for your sin and mine. He, he, he was dying there, suffering hell for, for sinners who have rejected him at, at times or, or pushed him away. Lord, I don't want to listen to you. But the Lord says, I'm going to die for you anyways. I'm going to continue to love you to the very end. And yes, we must understand there is an end to God's patience. And we don't want to test that. We don't want to see how long that will last. Because we don't know how long it will last. Instead, when we experience God's reckless patience, we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for being patient with me again. Thank you for walking with me on this journey of life that I struggle with, that I continue to trip and fall. Lord, thank you for being patient with me. And if God is patient with us, will we not be patient with one another? Showing this patience and saying we are going to journey on this life as Christians together. We are going to serve our Lord and Savior as a church family together. We are going to be patient with each other as they learn and grow in their skills, as we learn and struggle through hardship and trial, but also rejoicing in the blessings that God showers upon us and his church. How wonderful and patient God is that we could show this patience and forgiveness to others, that we can show this love to each other that only comes from God. Let us thank God for his patience, his reckless patience. Amen. Please.